I'm pleased to introduce to you Brian Wagner, Associate Professor in our English Department. After receiving his BA from Carleton College, he did his graduate work in English literature, language and literature at the University of Virginia. He completed his PhD in 2002 and came to Berkeley straight thereafter, where he has held his position in the English Department since then. Uh, his research focuses on African-American expression in the context of slavery and its aftermath. He has secondary interest in legal history and vernacular culture. Uh, I'll name a couple of his books. Uh, one is Disturbing the Peace, Black Culture and the Police Power After Slavery in 2009, The Tar Baby, A Global History in 2017, and in 2019, The Life and Legend of Brock Hupe, a fugitive slave who fought the law, ruled the swamp, danced at Congo Square, invented jazz, and died for love. Great title. Uh, he's also the co-editor of a collection of critical essays with the title Looking for Law in All the Wrong Places, uh, published in 2019. Apart from his teaching in the English department, he is affiliated with the American Studies Program, the Berkeley Interdisciplinary Migration Initiative, and the Center for the Study of Law and Society. He's also involved in um, digital humanities, having long been involved in the Word Seer Project, a text analysis tool for the humanities, and now directing the collaborative digital archive, Louisiana Slave Conspiracies. I'm delighted to welcome him here today uh, to speak to us on Charles Chestnut's Chestnut's novel, The Marrow of Tradition, 1901. Welcome, Brian. Thank you, Donald, for that generous introduction. Um, and, and thank you um, to the program for having me. And thank you for showing up, everybody. It's, it's great to see you. So I'm going to attempt to um, share my screen. So, um, OK, so um, I'm talking to you about, um, I, I think, just an incredibly important novel called um, The Marrow of Tradition. Um, I, I want to acknowledge at the outset that it, it does have a kind of strong um, contemporary um, resonance. Um, it's a novel, a historical novel, about um, an event that um, many consider the only successful coup um, on, on the soil of the United States. Um, and so um, there, there, there are many things to think about in terms of its, um, its relationship to our present. Um, so to start though, I wanna tell you a little bit about Charles Chestnut. This is a photograph of him here. Um, you might notice that phenotypically, um, he's, he's what we would probably now call um, a person of mixed race or a biracial person. Um, in the era of the so-called one drop rule, um, at you know around the turn of the 20th century, um, he was considered black um, uh, for um, for his um, his one eighth um, African American ancestry, um, and he he identified in this way throughout his life. He never he never chose to pass um, as white. He wrote some very interesting works as well about um, about uh, mixed race um, families in the so called color line. Um, he broke through as an author, actually writing um, uh, short stories that are imitations of um, plantation school um, conventions. Um, they're collected in this, this volume called The Conjure Woman, um, but they're published widely before then um, in, in the most you know, kind of um, influential uh, periodicals of the day, places like the Atlantic Monthly or the Nation or the Century. Um, they're really profound and amazing, um, but importantly, he was able to find such commercial and critical success because of his manipulation of the genre codes of the plantation tradition. The works transcend that tradition, um, but you know, the, the ways in which he is manipulating those codes is, is really the secret to their success there. Um, with the mayor of tradition though, um, he is really working with um, a very different kind um, of story and a different kind of literary mode. Um, this is um, self-consciously um, a protest novel. Um, he thinks about um, works like Uncle Tom's Cabin um, and um, work, the works of Albion Tourget is important um, precedence um, for, for what he's doing here. Um, it's a historical novel about a very recent event um, that he started to um, research right in 1899, right after the Wilmington insurrection of um, 1898. Um, the photo you see in front of you is actually taken by um, the, the insurrectionists um, after burning the, uh, the office um, of an African-American newspaper, the Daily Record, um, as, as part of the events um, of that day on November 10th of um, 1898. So I'll talk to you first a little bit about this event, you know, which is again, the, um, the point of reference um, for the novel before we dive into um, Chestnut's, um, Chestnut's representation of it. Um, so Wilmington, North Carolina in 1898, we need to know a little bit about 
um, what was happening there before um, the insurrection. This is a town that was rapidly modernizing, um, that was wealthy. Importantly, it had a racially integrated government in these years. Um, so following um, victories in 1894 and 1896, um, there were um, both white and black um, important um, uh, leaders in political office. There were many um, black civil servants. Um, the postmaster was African-American. Um, there were black police officers. Um, th this is a kind of vestige of the Reconstruction era uh, in some interesting ways where you actually really do have um, a, a broad political um, participation among African-Americans in those days. This town also has, um, as pictured on the, the right here, um, a very strong black middle class um, of professionals, um, and, and, and commercially um, successful um, artisans um, and brokers. Um, the, both the political and economic representation of African-Americans in Wilmington angered um, many local whites. Um, so it, it is the kind of um, it, ongoing success economic and political um, of this class of African-Americans in the city that according to most historians um, is the primary cause um, behind the insurrection of 1898. Um, the Wilmington Messenger um, is a white supremacist newspaper in the city. Um, in the novel, um, it, it's called the Morning Chronicle. Um, but you can see here um, an example of the kind of rhetoric that was being used by the messenger in the months and weeks leading up to um, the insurrection. Um, Negro domination was a term that they it frequently used to describe a range um, of um, uh, achievement um, and, um, uh, and representation among African-Americans in the city. Um, this is uh, a kind of announcing a meeting importantly organized by the Chamber of Commerce um, in the city. So um, the people behind the insurrection were, um, were kind of um, not um, a fringe element. They were, they were absolutely central to the organization of the city. Um, this is an, an announcement also in the messenger of the meeting of the white men of Wilmington. Um, this, is, this, is, this meeting is going to turn into the insurrection. Um, a full attendance is desired, it says, as business and the furtherance of white supremacy will be transacted. Okay, so that's, that's the announcement of the meeting um, that becomes the insurrection um, on the 10th of November. Um, just to give you a kind of sense of how um, the um, insurrection was covered in the messenger, but also um, generally in the press. You can see here, it says at the top, Negroism defunct. Um, this description here, the United White Men lift their state from the depths of political degradation to which she had been sunk by the Negroes and their so-called white allies. You know, I'm talking about the redemption of Wilmington through um, this, um, this insurrection um, and coup. Um, this is a, a kind of na official narrative that you see not only produced in the Wilmington Messenger, um, but also um, in other Southern newspapers, but also in places like the New York Times. This is really the story of the Wilmington insurrection um, as it appears um, broadly um, in a range of newspapers and periodicals at the time. It's also a story that gets adapted um, by Thomas Dixon in the first book of his Reconstruction trilogy, The Leopard Spots. Um, as you all may know, it's this trilogy that becomes the basis um, for the 1915 film, The Birth of a Nation. So that official story about um, the, the Wilmington insurrection as kind of uh, setting things right um, in Wilmington um, actually really does have broad influence um, in its time. Um, Chestnut though is trying to tell a very different kind of story. Again, he has family in Fayetteville right outside of, um, of Wilmington. He's living in Ohio at the time and he goes to Wilmington to talk to people to find out what happened um, in the wake of the, um, the insurrection. Um, he sets out to write a novel to counter the story that appears in the national press. Um, importantly, this novel is, you know, very specifically about the Wilmington insurrection of 1898, um, but it also really reaches out to think about the entire period um, that we now think of as um, the dawn of the Jim Crow era. Um, the historian Rayford Logan um, talks about this period as um, the so-called nadir of um, Black American history. Um, it's a time of, you know, a, a really epidemic lynching. Um, it's the, the emergence of segregation um, as, as a national regime is happening at this time. Disfranchisement or, you know, preventing people from voting is, is widespread. 
Um, there are examples of racist criminal justice, including the convict lease system and the chain gang and many other forms of policing that are rampant at the time. Um, there are many forms of anti-Black propaganda in newspapers, but also in popular culture broadly in this moment. And there are a range of so-called riots and mass atrocities, including the Wilmington insurrection, but also similar act acts that um, happened, for instance, in New Orleans in 1900 or in Atlanta in 1905, many other examples. So, you know, it's, it's a bit, sometimes students find this surprising, right? You know, because it, it, we are after slavery at this point. Um, but um, as Logan says, you know, there are many ways in which one might conceive this as a kind of low point um, in, in the history of a people. Um, and it's a, it's, so it's a very dire time. Um, and Chestnut is really trying to think through not only this very specific event of the Wilmington insurrection, but also these other, um, th these other historical patterns um, of, his, of his day. Um, um, I'm going to talk to you all um, a little bit about how these um, how, how these historical patterns um, become, um, you know, uh, uh, or, or given narrative form um, in in this work. There are a bunch of ways in which we can talk about the Marrow of Tradition as a historical novel. Right. I'm also really interested in how melodrama works in the book, um, but I really want to focus today in particular on characterization um, and also in particular on the ways in which Chestnut uses socially representative types, character types, um, putting them into motion and into interaction in order to make historical claims about the Wilmington insurrection and the dawn of the Jim Crow era. Um, so I, I think it's, you know, sometimes people call this book polemical. I don't think that's quite right. I think it really is the case that it's a book that is making a historical argument in narrative form. Um, and I'm going to be thinking about how he does that today by thinking about his use again of sometimes they call them flat, you know, or socially typical characters um, that are organized um, through a, a, a system. Um, so I'll just give you an example of the character system, one aspect of the character system of the novel. Um, here we're looking at um, the Delamere family and its satellites, and these various um, triangles um, have, have important narrative significance. Um, on the right, you can see the love triangle um, where Tom Delamere and Lee Ellis are rivals for Clara Pemberton's affection. Um, this is a kind of subplot where Chestnut is thinking about um, Tom and Lee as you know, potential um, future leaders. You know, Tom is um, that kind of negative example, um, a, a kind of scion of the old plantation class, um, dissipated in many ways. Lee Ellis is more progressive and open-minded. So there's a very kind of um, uh, uh, clear allegory in, in that romantic rivalry. Um, also important, um, old John Delamere, his, um, his son, Tom Delamere, and his servant, um, his African-American servant, Sandy Campbell. There's an interesting kind of triangle there because um, you'll, you'll remember that um, uh, Tom, um, Tom Delamere impersonates Sandy Campbell not once but twice. Um, first, um, in blackface um, at a cakewalk, and second, he, he um, dons blackface again um, in um, murdering um, and robbing Polly Ochiltree. So there's a, a triangle there where the, the system of the characters, um, a lot is happening. Um, there's also the suggestion, Tom's ability to impersonate Sandy Campbell, um, as well as some ever, other evidence in the, the, um, the book, suggests that Sandy Campbell may not be just John Delamere's favorite servant, but also his son. So just as there, there's other, there are other examples of miscegenation in the novel, um, there, there's the hint of miscegenation um, in this system as well. Um, I want to talk, though, about um, this is actually a family tree, um, the, the intertwined um, Miller and Carteret families. Um, and I want to talk about one particular character um, who's a kind of would-be protagonist of the book, um, William Miller. Um, and William Miller is very important, and I want to talk about how he's socially representative and then how the book handles um, his, his character. Um, so here's a passage that might tell you something about William Miller. Um, I'll read it to you. It says, Miller's father, Adam Miller, had been a thrifty colored man, the son of a slave who in the olden time had bought himself with money which he had earned and saved over and above what he had paid his master for his time. Adam Miller had inherited his father's thrift as well as his trade, which was that of a stevedore or contractor for the loading and unloading of vessels at the port of Wellington. Um, Wilmington is renamed Wellington in the novel. 
Um, in the flush turpentine days, following a few years after the Civil War, he had made money. His savings, shrewdly invested, had by constant accessions become a, const uh, a competence. He had brought up his eldest son to the trade, the other he had given a professional education and the proud hope that his children or his grandchildren might be gentlemen in the town where, one, where their ancestors had once been slaves. So this is a kind of story of a family pulling itself up by its bootstraps, right? It's a kind of American success story. Um, and that's, that's really um, important here um, that this is what um, Miller is meant to typify. Um, it, it's, it's important that we consider it in relationship to um, the thought of Booker T. Washington, um, who's really the preeminent African-American leader um, of the day, who's very much advocating for a kind of approach to life um, that's instantiated in the Miller family story. So William Miller both actually espouses the values of Booker T. Washington, the um, values of economic self-help, um, values of you know, deferring political protest, but he also embodies those values in his life story, right? And in his family story, in that he puts um, economic achievement first, puts economic achievement first with the hope that by demonstrating his merit in the world, um, that he will win recognition from his white neighbors, um, including political recognition. This is really the key idea of Washington's that's so important to the marrow of tradition. The kind of prediction that if you um, don't worry about demanding immediate um, rights if you don't protest against segregation, for instance, but instead accumulate property, um, make a name for yourself in the world, that inevitably um, political recognition will come, right? Um, but it will come through the self-evidence of your merit rather than through agitation and activism. Um, one thing I want to point out there is that there's a kind of necessity involved in that narrative um, that Washington um, offers, you know, that if you do this, then recognition will follow. Um, you all may know Washington's um, famous Cotton States and International Exposition Address of 1895, um, sometimes called his Atlanta Compromise Address, where he, he advances a lot of those ideas. Um, I don't want to call our attention quickly before we return to the novel to another speech he gives in 1895. It's not very well known. I think it's fascinating and really important to what Chestnut is doing. Um, it's called Mind and Matter. Um, it's republished in a collection called the Afro-American Encyclopedia. So let me read you a quotation um, from... Um, uh, from this, um, from this work. Um, so um, uh, I can't read actually the top, it's, it's hidden here. Um, but so in the town of Tuskegee, so Tuskegee is where um, his school um, at Tuskegee Institute is, is, is located. So when he came to the town of Tuskegee 14 years ago, there were some white people who wouldn't look at me, Washington says. I would meet one of these fellows and try to impress my importance upon him, but it didn't work. I knew a little about Latin, geometry, and physics, but what did they care? After a time, we began to put up a large brick building. The building brought them and they became our best friends. My friends, there is an unexplainable influence about a black man's living in a brick house that you cannot understand. When the black man can make his education felt in producing a brick house, nothing causes friction to pass away so soon. Um, so you have here then on the left, Cassidy Industrial Hall, um, Tuskegee is built out of brick. Um, and um, he's talking here, he, he has other essays about the houses of people. And this emphasis on brick as, as a good building material is really interesting here. I mean, one aspect is obviously his general emphasis upon industrial education rather than academic education, saying that it doesn't matter if I know Latin, if I build a brick building though, and make my merit self-evident, in the material world, you know, then I will then I will get somewhere. Um, but this kind of emphasis is interesting not only because there's a kind of three little pigs, you know, aspect to it, like you know, build out of bricks, not um, wood or straw, but also the ways in which he really believes that by producing a brick building, you pr you produce self evidence of um, your merit um, that forces your white neighbors, these people who wouldn't pay any attention to him when he first came to the town of Tuskegee, it forces them to rearrange their consciousness, right? You know, um, to, to deal with um, this evidence of the natural equality um, of 
Black Americans. So it's almost like a kind of sublime experience that Washington imagines happens when a brick house or a brick building is, is built, that it kind of um, you know, allows a kind of rearrangement of consciousness where natural equality becomes possible. He talks about this at length in his really fascinating autobiography, Up From Slavery, where he has a kind of parable even, I'm talking about the brickyard that he has in Tuskegee where people are pulling up clay, mixing their labor with nature, um, to produce um, these buildings um, that offer self-evidence of, of natural equality. It's really pretty fascinating. But again, brick is really important to him. Um, so what does this have to do with um, the marrow of tradition and what does it have to do with William Miller? Um, let's, let's take a look at this um, passage. Um, I'm again having this problem where I can't see the top of the passage. Um, um, okay, so... Um, uh, let me set the scene for you. Um, Polly Ochiltree and Olivia Carteret are, um, are driving through the town of, of Wilmington um, or Wellington, um, and they're coming upon a new building in the town, right? Um, and um, Polly has not seen it before. So what we're reading is her response to this new building. Um, so they, they're coming by a handsome brick building of modern construction, evidently an institution of some kind, um, uh, uh, surrounded on three sides by a grove of venerable oaks. Hugh Poindexter, Mrs. Ochiltree exclaimed explosively after a considerable silence, has been building a new house in place of the old family mansion burned during the war. It isn't Mr. Poindexter's house, Aunt Polly. That is the new colored hospital built by the colored doctor. The new colored hospital indeed, and the colored doctor. Before the war, the Negroes were all healthy, and when they got sick, we took care of them ourselves. New Poindexter has sold the graves of his ancestors to a Negro I should have starved first. He had his grandfather's grave opened, and there was nothing to remove except a few bits of heart pine from the coffin. All the rest had crumbled into dust, and he sold the dust to a Negro. The world is upside down. Okay, so this is, I think, a really... Um, fascinating um, passage um, in this book. Um, you know, um, it's important that um, Miller here is doing exactly um, what he is supposed to do um, as, as someone who espouses the values of Booker T. Washington. He's, he's built this, um, this new building. Importantly, it's a building that is both, you know, kind of evidence of his professional acumen and his class status, but also his evidence of his kind of duty to the race, his philanthropy. One of um, the, the slogans associated with the racial uplift movement and to some degree Booker T. Washington is lifting as we climb, right? So that's what uh, Miller is doing here. He's lifting as we climb. Importantly though too, um, uh, he's, um, uh, he, he's building this hospital out of brick, right? You know, so doing exactly what Washington says, he's using the right kind of business, um, the, the right kind of building material, um, presumably a kind of um, producing a kind of impression on the changing environment of Wilmington that will force his, his neighbors to reassess their assumptions about him, right? You know, to maybe consider this building as kind of natural evidence um, of, his, um, of his equality, um, recognizing him as a citizen as a result of his achievements. Okay, so that, that's, that's the, the hospital that is here. Again, it's something that's built with brick um, as Washington suggests. Um, Polly Ochiltree's response, though, is pretty interesting, right? You know, um, so Polly Ochiltree, you know, she thinks that um, what's happened here is that Hugh Poindexter has rebuilt his old family mansion. So that's interesting, right? Because it means that um, Ochiltree, she knows that the world is going to modernize, right? You know, like she knows that new handsome brick buildings will replace antebellum mansions, but she assumes that those new brick buildings will, will also be owned by the same old plantation elite, right? So she can think about modernization, but she has some baseline assumptions um, about race that orient her in the space of her city and orient her in history. Um, and this new building, this new colored hospital built out of brick, right, cannot be assimilated to those assumptions. Right. Um, so that's actually pretty close, interestingly, to what Washington predicts. Right. This is a kind of, you know, this is a kind of moment where she's, um, you know, forced to reckon with something that is heretofore unimaginable. Right. Um, and the, the point, though, um, where this this um, passage moves away from Washington's narrative predictions um, is in the response. Right. Um, the response she has is, you know, agitated, angry and violent. 
And, you know, she expresses her disorientation quite, you know, precisely. The world is upside down. Um, so what is going on here is part of a much larger pattern in the novel um, where you see people like William Miller, there are other many minor characters who are lawyers and, and such, um, who, um, who achieve in precisely the terms that Washington prescribes, but their achievement does not cause their neighbors to recognize the self-evidence of their natural equality. To the contrary, their achievements um, cause, um, you know, kind of agitation, um, increasing disorientation, anger, and eventually violence, you know, that's expressed here, um, you know, implicitly as a desire to turn the world right side up again. Um, so this is part of a larger pattern that Chestnut then uses to think about um, uh, the, the motivations behind the Wilmington riot of 1898. Those motivations, according to, to Chestnut, are precisely those um, that are anticipated here by Polly Ocheltree, a desire to erase evidence of, of black political representation in the city to erase evidence of black economic participation and success in the city to turn things right side up again, right? Um, is the motivation for the riot, but not only the motivation for the riot, also so many of the other new historical innovations that mark the dawn of the Jim Crow era. Um, in chapter five, um, the book has a really interesting engagement um, with the advent of um, legal segregation as a kind of national form in um, the wake of Plessy v. Ferguson, the, um, uh, the, the court case that gives us the term um, separate um, but equal. Um, William Miller is, um, uh, is, on a, um, is on a train um, writing and he experiences the new, the new re regime of segregation for the first time. Um, and again, um, you know, true to the pattern we just saw with Polly Ocheltree at the hospital, Chestnut represents the new regime of segregation as a regime that's designed to erase the black middle class, right? To keep them out of view. Um, actually kind of improvising on a part of the Plessy decision, he talks about how African-Americans are permitted into the white car if they're coming as a servant or as a nanny, right? Um, but if they're if they are a doctor, you know, no way, because they need to be kept from view for white passengers to maintain a kind of coherent sense of themselves, right? So disturbed um, they are um, by the existence of someone like William Miller. Um, so this is something that develops across the um, across the work. It's an interesting kind of class-based analysis of so many of these historical innovations at the beginning of the Jim Crow period. And again, it's a kind of key to how um, the, the book understands um, the, the fomenting um, of the riot. I just wanna mention quickly that um, the Mayor of Tradition is one of several really interesting works of literature, actually specifically novels engaged with um, Plessy v. Ferguson. Um, you all may know um, Pactolus Prime, um, Albion Tourget, the author of Pactolus Prime, um, was um, Homer Plessy's lawyer um, in, in, in the Supreme Court case. Um, and in very interesting ways in the novels, in pr particular this novel um, that he wrote before the case, he's trying out um, arguments about segregation that he then articulates in front of the Supreme Court. So that's a really interesting work. Um, also, Puddinhead Wilson, Mark Twain's novel, um, published you know, just before the, the final Plessy decision, is thinking very hard um, about, about segregation. So The Mayor of Tradition is one of several very interesting novels engaged with that particular legal decision. Um, so if it's the case that this kind of model where um, these kind of changes in the environment of Wilmington initiated um, by upwardly mobile African-Americans like William Miller are, are seen to be the kind of psychic cause behind the hysteria expressed in the riot. And um, we see that not only um, through Polly Ocheltree, not only through that chapter about um, the, um, the emergence of legal segregation, but in so many other places, um, including in the planning of the riot, which happens in um, the office of the Morning Chronicle. Um, again, that's a newspaper based on the will. But when you look at those meetings, very frequently what people are complaining about are these kinds of, um, uh, Captain McBain calls them spectacles of Negro domination. 
um, that include things like having African American police officers or African American politicians, or having um, you know uh, William Miller's um, wife Janet um, have a, a kind of sleek carriage, you know, um, and and a large diamond ring. These are the kinds of things that they talk about constantly as evidence of what they call Negro domination. Um, it, it's a way of saying what Polly says earlier in the novel, that the world is upside down. And in planning the insurrection, the big three, who are actually also based on an actual group called the Secret Nine in Wilmington, um, they, um, they're, they're overwhelmingly focused um, on, on this particular question of class formation. Um, it's in fact the case that um, in the actual riot um, or insurrection um, and in the novel, um, one of the things that happens um, near the peak of the insurrection is that white supremacists collect black political leaders and members of the city's black middle class and march them out of town. So this is a photograph of you know, th that actual um, you know, event in history. Um, it's also um, something that is um, described um, in detail um, in the novel. Um, I wanna mention as well that Ida B. Wells, the great activist um, of this era, really also does very frequently talk about the ways in which um, black economic success can trigger lynching and other kinds of mass atrocity. So um, Chestnut is offering, I think, a, 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 in some ways, a distinctive um, diagnosis, um, not only of the insurrection, but also segregation and these other kinds of violent practices. But it's not, it's not unique. Um, Ida B. Wells has many things to say in her extraordinary writings um, of this era, um, but, but very frequently she's focused on the ways in which economic competition, for instance, um, can, can supply the motivation for lynching. Um, and so it's important to think about Chestnut's writing um, along with hers. Um, I wanna go back to this family chart though. So this is the kind of intertwined Miller and Carteret families. Um, and I wanna talk um, a little bit um, about Miller's um, wife, um, Janet, okay? Because I think, um, you know, we've talked a little bit about how through one particular socially representative character, William Miller, a kind of argument is advanced about the causes of the insurrection. Um, there's actually more complication um, that we can develop pretty quickly um, by thinking about um, his relationship with his wife. So just to review the family chart here, um, it's important that, um, uh, so um, Samuel Merkel, um, Janet Miller's um, father, is actually also father to Olivia Carteret. So you'll remember Philip Carteret is the person who founds the Morning Chronicle, the Wilmington Messenger, right, in, in, in the novel. Um, he's one of the leading white supremacists. Um, importantly, though, um, not only did Samuel Merkel, um, uh, you know, have, have Olivia Carteret with an unnamed um, uh, legal wife, he also had Janet Miller with his servant, his African-American servant, Julia Brown. So Olivia and Janet are half sisters. Um, Janet, however, was not recognized um, by Merkel in his will. And so the, their um, relationship as half sisters is not, is not, um, is not something that's publicly acknowledged in the novel. Um, that actually happens um, because of um, because of something um, you know that we'll talk about in just a moment. Um, Polly Ochiltree suppresses his will, so her agency is important there as well. Um, but I want to I want to mark the fact though um, that these two families are um, kind of um, in interesting ways intertwined here, um, not only um, by blood. So this is another instance of miscegenation in the novel, as we talked about with the Delamere family, but also um, by questions of property. Right, um, because the the um, inheritance that by rights would be half Janet Miller's, this is what is prescribed in the will, is misdirected to Olivia Carteret, um, and it is Olivia Carteret's inheritance that Philip Carteret uses to found um, the Morning Chronicle, the white supremacist newspaper. Um, it's also the case that um, William and Janet Miller live in the Carteret's old house. Right. Um, the Carterets, um, before the inheritance was misdirected their way, lost their fortune in the Civil War as William Miller's family was rising and were able to displace the Carterets from their home. Um, so the Carterets live in a new home um, bought with um, a misdirected inheritance, but are forced to see the Millers um, in their old home um, all of the time. And this is very frequently causing Olivia Carteret anxiety. Not anxiety, not, not unlike the anxiety that Polly Ochiltree feels when she sees the hospital. So there's much more to say about this, but the, the key point is that this kind of domestic plot um, adds additional dimensions 
to the historical analysis um, that's advanced um, through the story of William Miller and his achievements. Um, I'll give you an example of how this emerges in the novel. This is actually, we're back at the hospital um, where Polly Ocheltree again has seen um, the hospital for the first time and misrecognizes it as um, Hugh um, Poindexter's um, reconstructed mansion. Right after she has that hallucination, this exchange happens. She sees, um, I should say, um, Janet Miller coming out of the hospital and she again becomes quite agitated. She says, who is that woman, Olivia? Um, asked Miss Ocheltree abruptly with signs of agitation. The lady coming down the steps darted the approaching carriage a look which lingered involuntarily. So this is um, Janet looking um, to um, specifically to Olivia Carteret, as she's frequently doing in the book, um, kind of making a bid for recognition. She really wants Olivia to recognize her as her sister. She wants that familial recognition. Um, Mrs. Carteret, back in the, the carriage, perceiving this glance, turned away coldly. With a sudden hardening of her own features, the other woman lifted the little boy into the buggy and drove sharply away in the direction opposite to that taken by Mrs. Carteret's carriage. Who is that woman, Olivia? Repeated Mrs. Ochiltree with marked emotion. Um, so why, this, is, this is really important because again, there are all these ways in which just as characters like Polly Ochiltree are disturbed by the evidence of William Miller's achievement in the, the kind of urban landscape of Wellington, so characters like Olivia Carteret are disturbed by evidence of this hidden secret in her own family, right? You know, um, she, you know she, she comes to, um, she, she at this moment doesn't actually know um, about the misdirection of the inheritance. It's this encounter actually that causes Polly Ocheltree to tell Olivia Carteret that the money that she inherited from her father is at least half stolen. Um, but um, she, from the very beginning, has this really um, kind of queasy sense about um, Janet Miller and the ways in which um, Janet Miller um, challenges her own legitimacy, um, her family's legitimacy, and her own identity in these powerful ways. So the same kind of anxiety and agitation and disorientation that um, the William, Miller, Miller, William Miller's hospital occasions in Polly Ocheltree, Janet Miller's conspicuous presence in town um, occasions in Olivia Carteret. So this is an added dimension then, which is a kind of historical dimension, which has to do with um, the, the ways in which the Carterets must ignore the Millers in order to maintain their sense of themselves, their sense of their family history, their sense of their legitimacy. Um, it's built into um, a kind of um, family backstory that um, forces us to think about things like property and miscegenation um, in addition to the, the other concerns um, about um, public accommodations and politics um, that, that are addressed through William Miller. Um, I wanna note as well that in this family um, chart, um, the, two, um, uh, the two sons, um, uh, the Miller's son is not named, but Dodie Carteret, those are both um, in, in a quite um, familiar way um, characters who are set up as kind of um, portents of the future. You know, so what kind of future will Wellington have? Right? Will it be the case that a character like Dodie Carteret will emerge, um, you know, and um, you know, uh, return to the kind of authority and power of his ancestors, um, where um, there is a, a large um, black underclass um, to to provide labor, or will um, Janet and William Miller's son continue that trajectory, that onward and upward trajectory we we read just a moment ago, right? Where um, his father's he will build on his father's success, and perhaps again be the kind of um, portent of a future in which not only um, kind of economic success but political recognition are are widely shared um, in the um, in in the town. Um, there's so there's this interesting competition between the two. Dodie is always kind of sick, and his life is in danger, including toward the end of the novel, um, indicating in a not subtle way, this is a not a subtle novel, which I kind of love about it, but indicating in a um, not subtle way that, um, you know, um, the kind of dream of the future supported by Dodie um, is, is, is in jeopardy, is being challenged um, by facts on the ground in, in, in Wilmington. Um, but so this kind of sense of the, the kind of, um, you know, implied or symbolic rivalry between Dodie and the Miller son are, are very important. 
Um, so um, a lot of this, this subplot concerning the relationship between Olivia Carteret and Janet Miller um, really um, uh, you know, is expressed at the climax of the book on um, the last chapter, which is called The Sisters. Um, and what happens in this chapter, so much of the riot has been, you know, it's been exploding everywhere. Um, but it's the case that um, Dodie has been hit by a stray bullet um, and the only person available um, who can potentially come to, um, to save him is William Miller, ironically. Um, and so at this point, finally, after having so many chapters of um, Olivia Carteret ignoring Janet Miller, you know, needing to ignore Janet Miller to maintain her sense of herself, um, she has to go to beg her to acknowledge their family relationship and beg her to get her husband, William Miller, to come and operate on Dodie so Dodie will not die. Um, so that recognition that um, Janet has been, you know, you know, desiring, you know, asking for um, this whole novel, which is again a kind of form of the promised political recognition that has been deferred um, for the Miller family um, in so many different aspects um, of this book. That rec recognition comes, but it comes too late, right? It comes after you know, the, the newspaper building, the black newspaper building has been burned. It comes after people have been exiled, after all the progress made in the city has been um, virtually undone by a successful coup. Um, and so that's really important to, to how the end of the novel works here. It's also important that Miller does eventually decide to go. Um, and in going to the Carteret mansion undoes a previous scene in which he, re he has refused entry into the Carteret mansion because he's coming as a professional, as a doctor. Again, actually in that earlier chapter to operate on Dodie. That first time around, he's denied. It said that he would be allowed in as a servant as an equal, no way. Right in this final chapter, he actually comes in as an equal. Um, so that form of recognition arrives as well in parallel with the recognition of Janet Miller. But in both cases, that recognition arrives in a way that feels quite empty, right? Um, and it leaves then the novel with very, you know, um, a, a profound lack of clarity about the future, right? Um, you know, the, the town is in tatters. Um, but as Miller walks in to operate on Dodie, the final moment of the novel, um, there are a lot of open questions about what you know, the future holds. Um, it is a very dispiriting ending, but there are ways in which it's also an open ending, um, I would insist. And I think that's important because again, if you think back to um, Booker T. Washington and um, his thinking about the brick house. One of the important things, again, about that prescription is um, it has a kind of necessity, right? If you build a brick house, it will bring eventually a kind of full social recognition, right? Like there, there's a kind of necessity implied um, by that recipe, right, um, that, that Washington offers. Here, what William Miller and Janet Miller learn over the course of the novel um, is you know, both that um, kind of white identity and white psychology is a lot more rigid than Washington thinks, right? You know, that the emergence of these new, um, th this new kind of evidence of black equality will not, um, you know, will not lead to recognition. It will, on the contrary, lead to violence, right? That's one thing they learn. But they also learn that history is a lot more contingent, you know, a lot more, um, a lot more, um, uh, you know, unpredictable um, than, than Washington would have it. I um, mean, so the openness of the ending, I think, then is another. And, and I think kind of profound way in which you see Chestnut kind of intervening in um, the politics of racial uplift um, advocated by Booker T. Washington and thinking about the failure of those prescriptions in the context of a place like Wilmington and in the context um, of, um, of the emergence of, of the Jim Crow era. Um, I should mention that, um, you know, I, I, I told you all that um, uh, Chestnut had some pretty extraordinary commercial and critical success with his Conjure stories, um, including you know, winning the support of William Dean Howells, um, who's an editor and author of great you know, um, influence in his day. Um, the Marrow of Tradition um, was a total failure, um, critically um, and commercially. Um, uh, uh, Howells disavowed the novel, he said it was too bitter, um, and it effectively ended 
Chestnut's literary career, um, publishing The Marrow of Tradition. He publishes another novel in 1905 um, called um, The Colonel's Dream, but effectively it was The Marrow of Tradition that ended his literary career. He gets some belated um, accolades during the Harlem Renaissance of the 1920s, um, but really after The Marrow of Tradition, he returns to um, his legal services office, um, doing stenography and offering um, other, other kinds of basic legal services, um, abandoning um, the, the vocation of authorship, having you know, um, been so bitterly disappointed um, by his reading public's um, uh, uh, you know, failure um, to appreciate um, what he's been, uh, he, what he was attempting to accomplish in this novel. It's really not until the 1990s, I would say, um, that this book becomes um, widely read again. Um, there's a scholar named Eric Sunquist um, who publishes a great chapter in his book, To Wake the Nations, that becomes, it's, it's um, kind of condensed to become the introduction to the book um, in the Penguin edition. Um, that's quite extraordinary and influential in um, bringing this book back. So this is an example of a recovered work of literature um, that for a long time um, was, was ignored, um, that now for, for, for most um, is considered quite basic um, to the, um, the literary canon of the United States. Um, and so it has a kind of extraordinary career um, of its own. Okay, so I will, um, I will stop there. I can figure out how to, wait, nope, how do I stop this? Um, ah, stop share. Okay, so um, I, will, I will stop there um, and um, we have some time for conversation. I've really kind of focused on really one kind of narrow aspect of this book. Um, you know, as you all may have noticed, there's, there's a lot more happening here. So um, we, can, we can, there are a lot of things we might potentially consider together. Thank you very much, Brian. That was that was really uh, wonderful, uh, very revealing. I, I had never heard of the novel before. I'm ashamed to say, but uh, um, I guess it must be in the public domain. So I guess it should be pretty easy to get now on the internet, right? Uh, and so it's on my list. Uh, so thank you. Um, all right. Um, so please, if you have questions, uh, put them in the chat. Uh, we've got a couple already in there. So let's start with those. Um, where were the whites in Wilmington from? Um, it was, so Wilmington is a port city, you know, and so it, it's actually, it's a kind of town where um, uh, people were, I, I think, you know, for a while as it was building up in the early um, 19th century, they're coming from other parts of North Carolina, you know, and so it's, um, uh, you know, it, it's, it's hard to, um, uh, I don't think it's, I don't think it's really possible to, to offer a blanket generalization about their, their origins, or I guess maybe their European or origins, you know, um, they'd be probably Scotch Irish as a lot of, a lot of places would be, um, but I'm not sure it would be, um, I'm not sure it's possible to really generalize um, about their, their ethnic composition, if that's the thrust of the question. Uh, well, I, I'm sorry, I just wanted to add something about that question. This is Avi. The, so is it possible that in the first uh, newspaper listing that you put up uh, saying that the uh, white supremacists wanted to uh, especially oppose the so-called white allies who were dealing with the middle class, uh, is it possible that the white allies would have been from a distinct ethnic background that differed from the white supremacists? Yeah, no, so I don't know. That's a really that's a really good question, and I think you know I, I think I can say pretty definitively no. You know that that's not a kind of ethnic composition. That is a kind of political composition that you see happening all over the Reconstruction period, right? You know, and so it's an interesting thing. We tend to think of Reconstruction ending in um, 1877. Right, you know, so this is after um, historians now tend to see the end of Reconstruction much more flexibly, right? You know, so you, you could actually imagine the election of these, um, uh, you know, um, African American politicians and their allies in in 1894 and 96, and as, as an extension of Reconstruction. So just as under Reconstruction you have people of um, various um, kinds of white ethnicities allying as carpetbaggers or scalawags, so-called, um, with black politicians in the South, you see the same thing happening in Wilmington in the 1890s. So I, I think it's it's pretty um, agreed um, among historians um, that there isn't that kind of distinct ethnic composition, um, but that class of um, of allies um, is very interesting, and the the, the kind of rivalry. Um, and difficulty that sometimes develops there 
um, is, 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 is really important. I'm very interested in this person, Oscar Dunn, who was um, a lieutenant governor in Louisiana, um, an African-American lieutenant governor, who has a lot of rivalry with um, the carpetbagger white governor of his time. So those kinds of alliances also um, have their kinds of discontents um, and, they're, and they're, they can be very interesting to trace. But I don't think either in Wilmington or in the kind of immediately preceding decades where you're seeing those kinds of um, interracial alliances um, that we often associate with reconstruction, I'm not sure that there's a, a um, predictable white ethnic um, component. All right, there, well, there was a comment. Um, so the whites is the big bad wolf and the, and the maid of good strategy is the only effective defense, I guess it must be that a black person would have or, um, uh, I mean, does, is that implied by what Booker Washington is? T. Washington was yeah, doing. So, <laughs> if you yeah. didn't have such a <laughs> such a fortress, you were not going to get respected. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so it is. I mean, so he does. I should say that you know he could, but he does not invoke the Three Little Pigs. You know, that was my uh, my my um, you know lanyard. You know, that was that was offering to you all. Um, he really talks about it not as like. Um, you know, um, brick buildings are good because if they get attacked by white supremacists, the building will still be standing, you know, or won't be burnt, for instance. I mean, it's actually interesting because they burn Alex Manley's newspaper office, which is built out of wood. Um, I think his point, again, is just that, to, that, you know, brick is an expensive, modern, you know, good quality building material. And for someone like William Miller to build this, you know, monumental hospital um, is, for many of his white neighbors, unimaginable. Right? It's like something they just can't conceive, right? You know that he could he could do this, right? And so this is, I think, what Washington is talking about, and what Washington tried to achieve in building Tuskegee exclusively out of brick. You know, I mean, this is the, he talks about this in his autobiography as well as in that speech that he conceives it as a kind of building material that makes self-evident and non-negotiable, right? The kind of force, you know, of of, of his intellect. An achievement in the world. And by forcing his white neighbors to, you know, kind of reckon with that, um, he assumes that they will inevitably have to recognize his natural equality. Um, obviously, what Chestnut is saying is, you know, um, to the contrary, um, this will be something that will drive them to distraction and violence, right? You know, and so um, they're both thinking about the brick building as something that is um, you know, to some, to some degree, a kind of source of wonder or something unimaginable, you know, um, according to the kind of existing assumptions of a person like Polly Ocheltree, right? But they're saying that the, re the reaction will be something different. Whereas um, Washington imagines a kind of renovation of white consciousness that will lead to the recognition of equality. Um, Chestnut, um, you know, instead says that this kind of, um, the, the advent of the brick building will, will lead to violence. I guess there is an eerie parallel to Barack Obama as a black president, <laughs> not, not, leading, <laughs> not leading to a better consciousness of the yeah. right? Yes. Um, there's a question here. Um, if you compare the novel with the historical events, how accurate was his portrayal of them? Uh, and did this have anything to do with the book's reception? I mean, if it was too true. <laughs> It, it's, you know, so so certainly there are a lot of things that are, um, uh, you know, so there are aspects of it that are kind of like a Romana clay, you know, like where you can say, you can say for sure this character, you know, is is this person, you know, so a lot of people think that I'm um, Alfred Charles Waddell and um, Philip Carteret are, are, are much the same. Um, a lot of the book is fictional, you know, and, and was and was by Chestnut fictional by design. So, for instance, there's a lynching plot um, that I mentioned where Sandy Campbell is um, is you know um, almost lynched for a crime he did not commit that is instead committed by the kind of scion of the um, of the Delamere family. Um, none of that happened, you know. So all of the things I'm describing about, um, for instance, Janet Miller and and, and William Miller, um, those are fictional, right? Uh, and so um, so there are a lot of aspects that are fictional. Um, there are aspects that are. Um, you know, publicly known, you know, where again, there's a kind of correspondence, right, where you can say, okay, the big three are the secret nine. Um, there are also kinds of documents, for instance, the um, insurrectionists drew up what they call a white declaration of independence, right, you know, and so that document also then appears in the novel. So there are a lot of things where um, if you just go and look at the Wilmington Messenger, 
You know, it's like very clear, you know, clearly a correspondence. It's also the case, though, that Chestnut, as most historical novelists are doing, it's kind of inventing these other kinds of scenarios, the relations, again, among these socially representative characters, you know, to kind of offer a, a kind of historical claim, you know, about, about the riot. So it mixes fiction and fact, you know, um, and I mean, I think there's no question that it's, um, it's, lack of success is, is actually about how far away it was from the official representation of these events at the time. At the time, this was taken to be a kind of glorious and righteous, you know, kind of setting of things right, you know, including in the New York Times, you know, that to have an integrated government under these circumstances was unacceptable. That, to, you know, that, and, and so it was, his, the story he was telling is very different from that. And so it's bitterness to use um, Howells's term again, um, was something that that people could not take. So there wasn't. People did say that it wasn't true what he said, but the things that they say were not true um, are reflective of the, the their understanding of the insurrection as a uh, kind of justified action, you know, that exists in line um, with the you know the American Revolution. Um, someone asked whether recording will be available. Yes, uh, it is being recorded and will be available in. in in a short time, um, it takes a little while to process that, but it will be available on the, on the schedule page. Um, uh, so let's see, there's a question that asks, uh, compared with the recently published history of the actual insurrection, yeah. how does uh, his knowledge of the events or of the fiction novel compare? I mean, yeah. I, I think that I, I, you know, so there the novels discussed as well in, in, in that work. Um, I think it's called Wilmington's Lie, you know, and so in terms of the, the broad contours, um, it's, it's the case that Chestnut has been vindicated, right? You know, there are very few people who would say that, say, Birth of a Nation or The Leopard Spots is an accurate representation of United States history. Um, and, and by the same token, um, uh, historians of Wilmington, there have been an increasing number of, of histories of, of the Wilmington insurrection written, um, tend to, um, you know, tend to support um, Chestnut's interpretation of what's happening, including the class dynamics I was describing to you. Um, there, are other, there are other things that are going on as well, having to do with the nature of that inter interracial coalition um, and the advent of populism, you know, in, um, in, you know, in the American politics at the time. It's, it's, comp it's a complicated situation. Situation. Um, but it, I think that he's been, you know, uh, vindicated, you might say, in some ways. Again, most of the characters, especially the primary characters in the novel, are fictional, right? So it's not the case that every incident here claims to be um, a representation of a, something that happened in history. Um, but the representation of the insurrection itself, um, including its planning through the Morning Chronicle, um, is, is something that is pretty easy to verify and that more recent historians um, have tended to, um, uh, to, um, to support as, as a kind of um, analysis. Okay, we have a question about, um, have any movies been based on the novel? Probably not. So I, Sounds like a natural for him. Yeah, yes, nowadays. yes, yes, yes. So gosh, thank you, whoever asked that question. I've thought this for a long time and I've advocated for a long time that um, that someone should, it, it is the melodrama you know, in, in the kind of ways in which these characters work and the kind of intensity, you know, of the, um, of, of both the historical events, but also their depiction in the novel, I think would really just ask for cinematic um, you know, uh, uh, um, treatment. Um, it's interesting, there are a lot of works of early African-American literature for which I think that's true. Sometimes it's tricky. Like, so if you can think of 12 years a slave, but other works, you know, the slave narrative as a genre is really proto-cinematic in a lot of ways, you know, ways that are also kind of tricky and, and problematic in some ways. And so I would say the Marrow tradition for sure should, if anyone has friends in Hollywood, just go tell them to make a movie out of this book because I think it would be, it would be a, a profound opportunity. Um, but in general, I think there are a lot of classic early works of, of African-American literature that would translate in very interesting um, and ready terms um, to, um, to the silver screen. Uh, I think we're running out of things in the chat. Although I have one more question. I was wondering about the publishers uh, for yeah. these types of work. Um, yeah, um, so, so it's, it's published by the same big press, you know, that does, his, um, you know, his conjure tales. So it's an interesting kind of thing where, you know, he has all of the goodwill, right? Um, and this is, you know, both um, Chestnut and Paul Lawrence Dunbar, who's an African-American poet contemporary, are, are interesting because they are not publishing 
their writings through the small presses, often religiously based or social movement based, through which most African American writers at the time were, were, were getting their work into to circulation. They're going through the Atlantic Monthly, you know, or through the nation or through the century, the biggest literary organs of the time and publishing, you know, with the most reputable um, uh, you know, firms of the time. Um, so it it was, there was someone, you know, based on his reputation that was willing to, a big firm that was willing to bring out this book, right? Um, it, however, you know, wasn't the material, the kind of material he had published previously, you know, and it was um, both a critical and commercial failure. So he is in, prior to this book coming out, there are high expectations. Um, he comes to people though with a very different kind of work you know, with uh, very explicitly political themes, um, and um, people aren't able to, um, to 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 work through what he presents. One can't help thinking, as you talk about this, about the parallels between our current presumably failed insurrection and this one that was apparently successful. Uh, and I know nothing about it. Did, can you say anything about what you think the differences are that? led to the success of the Wilmington insurrection that are different from the current one? Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's, a, really, it's a really great question. And for me, I'm, how success or failure is a really kind of complicated um, way of thinking about the two. I'm still trying to, like so many of us, I'm still trying to work through um, you know, the events of, of January 6th. Um, one of the things that I, I feel pretty sure about um, having reflected on it is um, the way that, you know, the strong kinds of parallels that we know existed um, between the kind of um, culture, um, you, you know, or like the, you know, so one, one thing that people noticed about um, what happened at the Capitol on January 6th with all these people in these strange costumes, you know, and kind of like acting as if they were at some kind of strange festival, you know, um, uh, you know, as, as they entered the state house or the Capitol, um, that's actually, that seemed weird to me at first until a friend pointed out um, that this is how lynch mobs behaved, right? You know, it was a kind of, it was a kind of festive atmosphere. There were people um, who were donning kind of parodic costumes, families were coming out, you know, it was, it was, it was, you know, it had a kind of frequently um, uh, comic and, and frivolous mode to it. Um, the same too with some aspects of, um, uh, mass atrocities um, like the, the Wilmington insurrection. So that the, the, the way in which, you know, something that seemed to me not to make sense, you know, why it was that people were wearing funny helmets with horns and um, strange costumes as they stormed the Capitol on January 6th has begun to make more sense um, as, as I've reflected on the kinds of events that were happening around the turn of the 20th century, including those represented um, in the marrow of um, tradition. Um, so in general, I mean, it's an interesting thing. I mean, I think about this a lot, both in teaching and in my research. I tend not to make really direct connections between um, the works that I'm teaching um, and our contemporary world, in part because um, as you know, a historian and literary um, critic, I'm often um, kind of bothered by um, the oversimplification you know, of the ways in which past and present are similar or different. Um, and I always want to kind of make things more complicated. Um, I, I found though that it can actually be best, or at least this is the mode I've adopted in my writing and in my teaching to kind of present the past or bring the work from the past and then have students and readers really kind of then reflect on how the works relate to our present in a whole bunch of different ways. Um, so this is to say, I'm like, I'm, 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 I'm for, I'm not sure if this is distinctive to me or not, but I'm, I'm, I'm often a little bit shy and reluctant about making those kinds of connections. You know, I've written about, say, the origins of, um, of police institutions in the United States as they're in interfacing with um, culture um, and, um, and the state in certain moments. And it's very clear that there are um, connections between what's happening in places like New Orleans in the 1830s and Atlanta in the 1870s. Um, and what's happened um, with um, uh, policing and protests against policing um, this year, last year and previous years as well. Um, I tend to want to get my, the story that I know, the research that I've done into the world, into the hands of students, into the minds of readers um, and allow them to make their own conclusions about the contemporary relevance of these historical 
cases. Um, USA, very, a very strange thing happened in the fall, which is that USA Today um, uh, published a front page story about the historical case I had written about in um, New Orleans in the 1830s. And it was very difficult for me to work with the writer of that story, figuring out how to actually nail down the connection between past and present. Because I always wanted to say it's more complicated, it's more complicated, but there is something that's very important about history, right? And the ways that it can provide an orientation in our present. And sometimes that requires some degree of simplification. Um, so this is to say, I'm, 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 you know, often again, kind of reluctant to make these kinds of connections, but it is absolutely certainly the case. There are a number of newspapers that have commented on Wilmington 1898 in relationship to um, January 6th of this year. Uh, and there's no question that it's a historical event um, with, with powerful contemporary relevance for us. Relevance that I'm still trying to think through myself. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes, hi, this is Joan. I'm, and I'm sorry um, to the professor um, Wagner. What is your area of expertise um, in terms of you don't feel comfortable bringing, you know, the past to the future. And I'm just going to use an example, um, yeah. such as policing. Yeah. Um, and, you know, that was cattling uh, to uh, police. Originally it was slave chasers, and then yeah. they became a police force. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm, I just wanted a little history on what was your area of expertise in English and African-American sure. studies. Sure. Yeah. Um, so I, I should say that I'm, I'm in no sense denying that there is um, a direct connection, you know, um, or powerful connection between the past and the present. You know, this is always, um, this is always the case. Um, it's that my writing and my teaching, um, uh, I don't, you know, I, I, I don't make all of those connections explicit all the time. I think that they're kind of self-evident, right? And they're complicated. And so you can talk, I think, I, and I actually think, you know, the, the origins of police departments are comp, I, I think that there's actually a slight important difference between cities um, that had police departments in slave states. Um, it's very important. People for a long time thought police departments developed in Boston and New York and um, Philadelphia first. No, they develop in, in, in cities in slave states. But those institutions are actually very different from slave patrol. Sometimes people say that there's a genealogical connection. I think it's important that they're distinct. Um, and there's no question at all that the development of police first in slave cities in the United States has everything to do with the current you know, organization of society and the state in, in, in the United States. It's just that I um, don't um, you know, try to nail down all of those connections for people. I bring the history you know, um, I assume the powerful connection between past and present, um, but my role is to is to bring these historical cases to inspire reflection. I'm not, in other words, you might say a pundit. You know, like I'm not make I'm not making kinds of arguments about what people should do now. I'm not trying to speak on behalf of somebody else. I'm rather trying to contribute to a. a incredibly important conversation that's happening now by bringing these kinds of cases, um, these kinds of works from the past into the present um, to, um, to bring some kind of energy and light um, to, um, to, to an important debate that's happening now. So I hope that's clear. It's not that I'm denying the connection. It's just that I don't see the, my work as um, making the connection for people. Um, there's obviously a connection, but it, it's, it's something to, to think about together. Okay, I, I understand. I was just, I was confused because, and I just want to make one more comment that I, I don't sure, know what please. time was over at three, but um, my other comment was the Booker T. Washington, you know, um, don't protest, don't do this, you know, make it through um, education and self-supporting and economics. And we found out this last year, if you didn't know before, um, I am African-American, but if you didn't know before, you know, institutional racism is at every level. Yep. You know, it's at Cal, it's in the system, it's in the educational system. And so when I was, when you were um, talking about that, it was, um, 
I, I was like, yeah, that's a nice dream. And yes, it <laughs> would be nice if we're on equal playing grounds. But really what pisses me off is when you have uh, Oprah, you have uh, Obama mm -hmm. and, 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 and everyone else, well, why can't everyone else make it? Well, you can't make it if you have these hidden things tied into a system that puts you, keeps you down. And so um, that was just really interesting to, um, you know, hear that yeah. and to even actually ha see it happen to this particular author when his yeah. book or, or articles weren't selling that he didn't get the opportunity. You know, you can have, you, you know, you're a writer, you can have a bad book and the university is still going to be behind you because yeah. it's not, everything is not sellable. So it's yeah. just, um, I'm just expressing myself. It was just very interesting to, um, I, I enjoyed your whole presentation, mm. but I'm just pulling different things out and mm. I could have asked questions throughout the entire, um, <laughs> the entire <laughs> presentation, but it was, I, I've never read the book, didn't know the author. So I appreciate your knowledge and your wealth of um, information that you gave us today. Thank, thank you so much. That 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 means that means a lot. And yeah, I mean, I think um, Charles Chestnut is on the same page as you about um, institutional racism, and you know, kind of like how ingrained it is, right? You know, like so there are a lot of um, people who are critical. Booker T. Washington had tremendous, um, as, as you know, um, institutional cachet and power in his day. Um, there were lots of critics, right? You know, Ida B. Wells was a critic. W. E. B. Du Bois was a critic. Charles Chestnut in this novel was um, a critic. And one of the things, again, that I think Chestnut is saying here um, is a version of the point you were making about how institutional racism, and also for him, it's a kind of psychic matter, right? You know, it's like so much more ingrained than you imagine, you know, um, that it's not simply the case that building a brick house can change everything, right? You know, um, Chestnut is like, no, actually, when you do that, um, what, what happens is that you know, the, the, the institutional and psychic structures of white supremacy will not abide that kind of achievement. You know, it will go to the, the, the greatest lengths, the most radical lengths imaginable to erase, you know, um, the evidence of your existence. Um, and so, um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I think that I think the chestnut is very much on the same page with you. And a lot of the time, in retrospect, we look at Booker T. Washington um, with that kind of um, skepticism. Um, it's important, too, that they're very important um, kind of critics in his own day. Um, including Chestnut, who were able to see through um, those prescriptions. Thank you. Anyone else? Uh, we had one more comment added saying that there's another novel called The Best of Enemies by Asha Gray Davidson, uh, which has been made into a movie, hmm. which is about uh, <clears throat> a former KKK member who befriends a black civic leader. All right, I think that's, uh, I think we've come to the end for today. I want to remind everybody that um, next, uh, I guess it's Wednesday and not Tuesday, I believe. Is that right? Yes, it's on Wednesday next week and not Tuesday. Uh, Catherine Flynn will talk to us about James Joyce uh, in our continuing series. And once again, I want to thank uh, Brian Wagner for a, a really uh, illuminating um, and um, inspiring talk about uh, this that I think many people have put this on their list to to read very soon. <laughs> thank you very much, Brian. Thank, thank you, you, Donald. And, and thank you, everyone, for, um, for, for coming out. It was, it was great talking with you all.